Here we are in chapter 14. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 21 through 40. I'll begin by looking at verses 21 and 22, introduce it, and then we'll move into our, our study. So we're going to begin at verse 20, 21. We'll continue and conclude the chapter, chapter 14 tonight, by going from verse 21 to verse 40. So here we are, verse uh, 21, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul writing writes, In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. And so as he begins here in verse 21, he's actually quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from Isaiah. The scripture that he quotes with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, is found in Isaiah chapter 20, 28, verses 11 and 12. Now, to get some context to understand what Paul is saying when he speaks in this manner, men with other tongues and other lips, with men of other tongues and other lips, I'll speak to this people. We need to know that, uh, that Isaiah was a, a prophet who prophesied around 15 years this particular prophecy, around 15 years before Assyria conquered northern Israel. When you look at your Bible, you look at your Old Testament, you discover that there was an invasion. The Assyrians invaded and uh, took the ten northern tribes of Israel captive, and they did so because God allowed that because Israel had an, what would we, we would call an unrepentant apostasy. And so 2 Kings chapter 17 records how Assyria did that. Now, some 800 years before Isaiah was written, God had prophesied judgment to Israel through Moses. There's a section in the law in the book of Deuteronomy. It's found in chapter 28, verse 49, where God promises chastisement to the nation if they disobey him. Deuteronomy 28, 49 says, The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down a nation whose language you will not understand. Now, a hundred years after Isaiah was written, God spoke to Jeremiah, a prophet who prophesied in Judah. And in Jeremiah 5.15, it says, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, I am bringing a distant nation against you, an ancient and enduring nation, a people whose language you do not know, whose speech you do not understand. When you understand and remember that the 12 tribes of Israel were divided into 10 northern tribes and two southern tribes, that judgment came upon them in two different ways. One is through Assyria, and then over 100 years later through Babylon. And then you begin to look back in Deuteronomy, and you see that God had prophesied or stated that he would bring judgment, and it would occur with the nation of people who would come in whose language these people didn't understand you can see that what Paul is speaking about concerning here is a sign. It's a sign of judgment. And the sign of judgment would be, he's saying here, a language that they wouldn't understand. So on the day of Pentecost, there were those who were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And as we look at the day of Pentecost and when it came and, and what had happened, it's found in Acts chapter 2. And you begin to look at the nations that are represented there. There are some 16 nations that are represented. Uh, we discovered that they were given, uh, the, the people who received the, 100, the 120 who had received the, uh, the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and had poured out and began to speak in unlearned languages, you could see that those who were there celebrating at that time, ce celebrating Pentecost, when they heard the, the uh, believers speaking in their languages, you could see that the unbelieving Jews could have seen judgment that was going to come because of these languages that were spoken because it had been prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, ultimately, this final judgment, this, this huge judgment that is spoken of that would finally come actually came in A.D. 70 under Titus of Rome and the foreign soldiers who filled the street. So Paul's point is the Jews could have recognized that these unknown languages were a sign, a sign of judgment to come, but by not recognizing Messiah, they instead of receiving him, crucified him. So they placed themselves under judgment. And so in that context, 
tongues are a sign to unbelievers. Again in verse 21, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Therefore tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So when he says prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe, remembering back in chapter 14 at verse 3, remembering that he had spoken there and said that prophecy had an edifying um, ministry to the hearer. It, it, it was something that brought edification and exhortation and comfort. Then the primary gift of prophecy is as it occurs within the confines of the body of Christ is for an encouragement. It's not a primary sign of judgment to come. And so he's speaking of, of tongues and he's saying, you can look into the Old Testament and see that God had stated this would take place. And so it is a sign of judgment to come. On the day of Pentecost, when they spoke with other languages, it could have been understood that God was bringing a word to the people that judgment is coming. But on the other hand, when the church is gathered together and, and a word of prophecy is spoken, when that word is spoken, it's not sig signifying or it's not, uh, it's not established as a gift to necessarily bring um, a, a judgment, but rather when that gift is being exercised, it's intended to bring encouragement, edification, and comfort to those who are hearing. And so he continues that thought by saying, and this is, this is interesting, and I'll share how, how this works. He says in verse 23, Therefore, if the whole church comes together when, in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Um, yes, they will. Well, I'll go on. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's judged by all, thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. That's absolutely true. That There's no doubt about that. If, if we have somebody who comes in who's uninformed or somebody who comes in who is an unbeliever and they come into a church service, and I'll, I'll develop this for you, and... And it's a time of uh, exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And somebody speaks in a tongue. And this person's an unbeliever, never been around this at all. And they walk in and they hear somebody saying whatever they're saying in a, in a language that is unrecognizable to them. And perhaps in a cadence and, and words that don't seem to make any, any sense whatsoever and it won't to them. And then they see other people just, oh, you know, and raising their hands. They're, they're going to say, these guys are nuts. This place is bonkers. These people are out of their mind. They're going to say that. There's no doubt in my mind they're going to say that. What is going on here? This is crazy. They will say that. And, and that's what Paul is saying. He's saying that these people who walk in will not understand what's taking place. And so he's gonna, they're going to say, uh, you're out of your mind. But on the other hand, when he says in verse 24, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's judged by all, thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he'll worship God and report that God is truly among you. When, when prophecy does take place, and, and, and this is where I think sometimes we, the church, make a mistake, it's not necessarily in a group with five or six or eight people in an afterglow. Sometimes that occurs, and that is a natural way for that gift to be exercised, where believers are having what we call a believer's meeting or an afterglow meeting where you gather together, and there's maturity there, and uh, the gifts of the Spirit are, are in operation, and, and somebody may speak a tongue, but you have somebody there who interprets, and it's done decently, it's done in order, there's no confusion, it's a proper way to exercise that gift. Or somebody may have a word of exhortation or comfort or edification. It's a prophetic word where he's revealing the mind of God or the heart of God to somebody. Or maybe even speaking concerning some possible future events that we're going to see take place, that could take place. In Scripture, we see that happening more than once. Well, that happens in, we'll say, an afterglow or a believer's meeting. But one of the things to be aware of, and, and this is where sometimes we, the church, maybe make a mistake, is 
we need to understand that when the word of God is rightly divided, very often a prophetic gifting is occurring, but because there's no drum roll and there's no change of cadence and there's no sweating and there's no exaggerated speech pattern and suddenly the individual doesn't go into King James or whatever they feel, but there's just simply sharing and it happens a lot in Bible studies. It happens a lot in this church. What happens is, I'm, I'll, I'll put it like this. I don't say, oh, by the way, right now I'm going to exercise the gift of prophecy. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, my little children. I don't do that. I just keep sharing. But what happens is a, a person who's not a believer's heart is being revealed. It comes through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, and perhaps through an illustration or something that wasn't in the notes of that preacher that is coming out spontaneously, but reaching somebody's heart. That happens all the time. There have been many times when people have approached me after a service and said, you know, when you said this, that really spoke to my heart. And I don't even remember saying it because it was just something that was flowing. The Holy Spirit was moving. But in reality, the gift of prophecy is being exercised. Now, there are those who are receiving that and they're being encouraged, they're being comforted, they're being exhorted, and that's taking place in them. But the unbeliever who's there and he hears this taking place has his heart revealed and something within him or her responds. And that's what brings them to a knowledge that God is truly among you. How did you know this? Who told you that? I've had that question asked more than once. Who told you that? Who let you know I was doing that? And, and I don't know what they're talking about. I really don't. And I'll smile at them and I'll say, huh? Nobody. Did my mom talk to you? Did she tell you what I've been doing? No, should she? No. Huh? They've been mad. They've been angry in the pews before because something's being said and they think they've been ratted out. And what it is, it's the Holy Spirit. Now, what is interesting about that, taking it another step, is when the words are said, many times believers respond to those words with encouragement. God is moving. He's doing something. But at the same time, and I see this quite often, there'll be somebody who gets very upset. And often, those of you who sit in the back of the church will see this quite often. Almost every time I preach, somebody gets up and walks out. Almost every time. Sometimes they're very angry when they walk out. And that's my staff. I mean, then there's visitors who get even worse. It's really embarrassing. But they'll get angry. They'll get angry because something hit them. When God's word is rightly divided and the spirit is flowing, your heart will be revealed. The best thing to do, by the way, is when the Holy Spirit operates, is to, if you're on the operating table of the Holy Spirit, lie still. Lie still so the surgeon's scalpel will cut straight and remove that which shouldn't be there and bring you to health. So many people just roll off the table and crawl out of the you know, the, out of the, the room. They don't want to hear it. The Holy Spirit will bring conviction. And so when he's speaking here and he says in verse 24, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all and he's judged by all. Thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. So falling down on his face, he breaks his nose. No, so falling down on his face, he'll, I don't know why I just think that every time, falling down on his face, ow, um, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you because the secrets of his heart were revealed. My mom and my dad, before I got saved, especially mom and my sisters, but especially my mom, would get angry and hurt and tearful with me. You've got to stop this. You've got to stop this. You're going to die. You're going to kill yourself. You've got to stop this. Because I was doing one of these tailspins in my life. 
and I was taking more drugs, and I was drinking more, and I was living more dangerously, and my mom started seeing that. So she got concerned. I wasn't coming home at night, and when I came home, it'd be 2 or 3 in the morning, and that was, you know, any day of the week. It wasn't just Friday or Saturday when I partied. It was any time I could. And so I'd come home at 2 or 3, or I'd sleep in my car in some street in some in some, some neighborhood because I was too drunk to drive. I couldn't drive home, and my mom would get upset, and you've got to stop this. You've got to stop this. Then she'd say things like, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And I would say this to my mom. I would say, keep your prayers to yourself. Prayers are good for those who have a need for that kind of thing. Frankly, I don't need it. So if you want to pray, pray for yourself. Pray for my sisters. Pray for my brother. Pray for my dad. But leave me out of your prayers. I don't want it. Leave me alone. And that's what I would tell my mom. Just leave me alone. I'm fine the way I am. You don't like it. That's your problem. Adjust to it. That's how I was. Very kind, loving son. That's how I was. Absolutely. And mama would say, this, this is going to kill you. This is going to hurt you. Your life is going down the tubes. You've got to stop this. Why? You're going to die. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. I'll die when I die. I, that was my attitude. Like I, I, I'd wager if I was a betting man, like many of you in this room, probably the same as I was. So what? Who cares? Time's going to come. It's going to come. Who cares? I was living a dangerous and crazy life. So mama was pointing it out. But guess what? I didn't get saved until somebody brought the word of God. And the secrets of my heart were revealed. And the awareness of my lost condition was made apparent to me through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The words that that minister said were really, to be honest with you, not much different than what my mom was saying. You're living a lousy life. You have no joy. You're upset. Nothing's going right for you. You need God. My mom was saying the same thing. But the Holy Spirit was anointing that evangelist, Arthur Blessed. My heart was revealed, and that's how I got saved. And it was through a prophetic sense of the mind of God being revealed to man. And so... This person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's judged by all, the secrets of his heart are revealed. Falling down on his face, he worships God and reports that God is truly among you. He sees that the conviction of the Holy Spirit causes unbelievers to be converted as the word of God goes forth. Now, in verse 26, how is it then, brethren? Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So what he does here is he be begins to move into what we call proper order in the church. And the whole point he's going to make is do not exercise the gifts in a fleshly manner. Notice how he speaks of this. He says each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, a revelation, interpretation. In other words, you come and you want to share a psalm. A psalm is a song unto the Lord. And uh, in the early church, there were those who were writing songs, and they wanted to come, and they wanted to share the songs that they had, uh, that they had been given by the Lord. By the way, in the early days of the Jesus movement, that was very common. That which you today hear is called contemporary Christian music. Many of you um, are too young to remember the Jesus movement, and I thank God that many of you are too young because that means Jesus is still moving. But the Jesus movement, there were guys who would come in and they were leading worship on a Wednesday night and they'd begin to lead worship and they would say, God gave me this song today. And it would be a new song because the scripture speaks of singing a new song unto the Lord and that was very common. And so they would come under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and they would share a song. Well, that was something that happened when when I got saved, it still happens to this day. That was something that was common in the Corinthian church. He said, or you'll come with a teaching. You want to bring enlightenment on people's minds concerning the ways of God. You want to share with them. He's saying, you come and you want to speak in a tongue. Or you come with a revelation. You want to give some depth concerning God. You want to come with an interpretation. But what he's saying is, you're all eager to participate in the services. But it's carnality in your life that is driving you forward. You see, 
as I've been sharing with you, as it pertains to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you can exercise the gifts in the flesh. It's not that difficult to do. And that's what was taking place here. The flesh was actually behind what was going on in the Corinthian church services. And so he's asking, really, what is the proper motivation as you are gathered together? What really is it? And we need to remember that he had already stated, let all things be done for edification. When the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are, are being exercised, it should be with the intent to edify other people. Notice verse 12 in, in chapter 14, how he said, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Instead of wanting to be known, instead of wanting to be recognized, instead of wanting a position of power, authority, in, instead of wanting to become somebody special amongst the body of Christ, if you desire a gift of the Holy Spirit, desire it not so that you might be able to just be known as that guy who prophesies or that woman with that beautiful singing voice. Desire to excel for the kingdom of God. Die to yourself so that Jesus may be seen. Don't die to this desire to be known by men. Die to the desire to become looked at as some excellent specimen of Christian humanity. Learn what it means to, to take the lower seat with joy and, and, and begin to understand what it means when Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. Unfortunately, in a day when we reward Christian celebrities, that mentality is really not held by all who have positions of authority. Unfortunately, uh, the church is in need of heroes, and so we have a tendency of elevating people to superstardom. And unfortunately, any human being that is elevated to a position of celebrity status is bound to have feet of clay, and ultimately they will fail. And then the hopes are dashed in the hearts of those who raised them to that position. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why I let you know that I'm a man like everybody else because I don't want anybody to run around acting weird around me like I'm special. I know that I am, but no, I don't like it. I don't like it. I've had people approach me asking for my autograph. It's usually bill collectors, it, um, <laughs> you know, and I don't like it. It's not of the Lord. It's not good. It isn't good. I've had people trembling next to me, and I'll ask them, what's wrong? Are you okay? I'm just real nervous around you. Why? <laughs> you know, I brushed my teeth. I promise you, I have gum in my pocket. Why? I, I, I say that to you because you don't feel that, but maybe one or two people here could. So I say it. You know, all we are, all we pastors are, are all we are are people. That's all we are. Nothing greater, nothing better, nothing more important. Just people, just like you, struggling just like you. Yes, I'm perfect, but beyond that. <laughs> no, it's it just... I know I don't have to say that, but sometimes I feel that I must. Because bottom line is, I'll have people walk up and say, I don't like to take your time. I don't like taking time from you. And I smile at them and I say, you're not taking any time. I'm giving you time. It, you're not taking a thing. I'm giving it to you. It's a gift. If, if you think it's important, it's yours. <laughs> it's yours. I've had people walk up and in restaurants and say to me, excuse me, I don't want to bother you. And I'll say, you're not bothering me at all. Here's my check. Go pay it. No, I'll, I'll say, I, you're not bothering me at all. You know, I'm saying that to you because you may run across me sometime in a restaurant. I live around here. And if you do too, we are going to run across one another. And I want you to feel free. Never feel that you can't say hi to me. Never feel that you're, bo you're not bothering me. You never are. I don't like the idea of people thinking they're better than other people. My dad taught me that. My dad said, my dad was one of these men who would not stand in line for anybody. He just wouldn't. He said, he'd say this, he'd say, they put on their pants one leg at a time. 
just like I do. And my dad brought that into my life. There is nobody that is so important. And by the way, I'll go one step further and say this. I used to think that there was one person that was more important, and that was my own pastor, Chuck. So I do understand some of that because with Chuck, I actually would, would just before I talked to him, I'd say, okay, think good thoughts because he can read your mind. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hi, Chuck, how are you? And the Lord taught me a long time ago. I'm just sharing with you what I've had to learn myself, that's all. And Chuck is just a guy just like I am, and the Lord taught me that. And that's what we are. So there's nobody that important. The only one who is, is who? Jesus. He's the only one. He's the only one that matters. He's the only one that matters. Keep that in mind. And so sometimes when people are exercising gifts, or sometimes they have authority, or sometimes they... They come off in, in a way that causes other people to have a sense of intimidation and all. Sometimes they want that. When in reality, what the Lord is saying to us, listen, all things need to be done for the edification of other people. In verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. And so he makes it very clear that if anyone is speaking in a tongue, that there needs to be an order. That's intended to allow the gifts of the Spirit to operate in a fashion that is orderly. One person will speak at a time. So somebody may speak a tongue and uh, speak with tongues, and they wait. And then there would be someone who is given the opp opportunity for interpretation. And as they're exercising the gift of tongues, Remember, and he had already stated it in verses 15 and 16, that there, uh, there's a time to thank God and bless him. It says in verse 15, what's the result? I'll pray with the Spirit. I'll pray with the understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit. Sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of un uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he doesn't understand what you're saying? So tongues are, are, are used as a praise language to God. But he goes in verse 28, if there's no interpreter, then let him keep silent in church or just speak to himself. So we exercise control over our own facility of speech, and it gives direction, uh, the direction that believers' meetings have uh, an, an orderly, orderly uh, fashion. Now in verse 29, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything's revealed to another who sits by uh, let the first keep silent, for you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. So prophecy, when these people are speaking forth a word, that really requires spiritual discernment to be exercised. There needs to be uh, uh, the word discrimination, which in its literal meaning means to make rightful judgment. You need to have a discriminating uh, uh, attitude when somebody is purporting to speak in the name of God. If somebody's saying, the Lord has placed this on my heart, just because they're saying that doesn't mean I'm going to believe that. Because it may be they ate too much salsa that afternoon and just, it's not the Lord at all. It may just be a reaction. And that does happen because there are those who will say that. You know that especially this generation seems to be more prone to that. The church today, the generation in the church today seems to be more prone to emotionalism. And, and then people, I've had so many discussions over the years where people say, well, who are you to judge them? If the Lord lay that on their heart, who are you to judge them? Well, the word of God says that I'm supposed to discern. The word of God says I'm supposed to listen with an attitude of hearing as to whether or not that lines up with scripture. Because if it doesn't, I'm not to receive it. If they're saying something that does not line up with the word of God, as I've shared with you, I believe I already shared it one time where the lady approached me and said, um, this is my first time here, and um, I enjoyed uh, my time. And I said, well, that's wonderful. She said, the, word has laid, the Lord has laid a word on my heart for you. And I said, okay, and what would that be? And then she got quiet for a moment, and then she went into that theatrical kind of mode where that lets me know God is moving right now. And, and then she says, the Lord is saying, 
this is a good work, but if you were to have church services on Saturday, he would do a greater work. And I said, that isn't the Lord, that's you. That's you. You're a seventh-day observer, and you want me to become a seventh-day observer. That's you. That is not the Lord. So I'm not going to say, oh, sister, that is from God, because the word of God does not teach me that in order for God to show up, I have to call him by a certain name or I have to meet on a certain day. And so there are those who will just say what's on their mind, but it's not necessarily the mind of the Lord. And so when you're in a meeting and somebody says, thus saith the Lord, and then they say something or speak forth something, then you need to listen carefully. Every teacher, myself included, should have a group of people they're instructing who are discerning, discriminating, taking what's being said and checking it according to Scripture. There's nothing wrong with that. There's everything right with that. The Bible teaches that we ought to do that. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21, Paul said, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but he goes on to say, test all things, hold fast what is good. How do you test all things and hold fast to what is good? Does it line up with Scripture? Is it what God's Word teaches? So false prophets can enter into a church, and they can, by saying they're prophesying, spread error. Through the guise of the gift of prophecy, false teachings can be disseminated. So it's the responsibility of the believers to establish safeguards to prevent this from happening. Now, a mature believer will listen to what's being said and determine the authenticity. They discern. If it's in line with Scripture, they listen. If it does exalt Jesus, they listen. But if it's not lining up with Scripture and Jesus is not being exalted, that prophet needs to be told, you need to be silent. You need to stop. And that's what you do. And you can do that in a very gentle, loving way. You just say, shut up. No, you, 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 you just say, and that's enough, hold your peace. Have I ever had to do that when somebody's done something like that? Somebody asks, if I hear you, the answer is yes. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. I've had to silence people before in the past. And, and you can do it in a gentle way. You can say, that's enough. You need to stop. And, and they normally do. They normally will. And if they don't, I might as well say this, if they want to carry on, then what we do is we have ushers who will walk up and say, could you please silent, be silent, because this is running along Scripture's lines. And if they will not be silent, then we will walk them out the door. Rawl tells me the story of how at his fellowship, these two young men were in the front seat. Rawl gave an invitation, and one of these young men stood up during the invitation and turned and looked at the congregation and started yelling, this young man, he did not come forward at the invitation. He was just in the front row. And when these others came forward, and you know how exciting it is to see people getting saved. Well, this guy stood up and turned around and looked at the whole congregation that was present that day and started yelling out about Rawl, this man is a false prophet. This man is a false prophet. <laughs> and they had to walk him out. That's what happens. You know, he's, he's had people climb on the stage and start dancing with the band as the band is leading in worship. So if you want to dance, <laughs> I know a good place. And so there needs to be a decency and order in every church service. Wouldn't you agree? Well, obviously, of course. And that's what he's laying out here. He's saying we need to understand these things. When he says in verse 30, uh, if anything is revealed to another who sits by it, let the first keep silent. That would encourage others to exercise their gifts. It keeps someone from being placed in a, in a position of spiritual superiority over people, and it also undermines pride in, in the person exercising the gift when they yield with humility to somebody else. He says in verse 31, uh, for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn, and all may be encouraged. So every person with a gift is free to exercise the gift in a believer's meeting, not just three at a time. Now he goes on and says in verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophet. God doesn't force you to speak. God does not cause you to shout out. He doesn't make you sweat. He doesn't make you cry. 
whenever you're sharing, it is usually done with a reasonableness and it's done with a maturity. Again, I'm saying this to those who know, but sometimes if you watch the theatrical church services that you can find on Christian TV, you might get the idea that when the Spirit of the Lord is moving, there's some entertainment value to that. And that's simply not true. When the Holy Spirit is moving, it's not to cause the, the congregation to become an audience. It, it's intended to edify the body of Christ. One of the things that's very problematic today in the exercise and misuse of the gifts is that we begin, again, to, to look at it as being an opportunity to have God prove to us that he really exists through the authentic, authentication of his presence by people exercising spiritual gifts. And so what we do is we make the church service into something almost like a theater. So somebody sweats or somebody cries or somebody rolls around or somebody does something outlandish. And people say, man, the Lord was all over that guy. Do you see that? And Paul would disagree with that 100%. Now, he says in verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Now he gets into a portion of scripture that, that I just love. <laughs> let your women keep silent. Oh, thank you, Jesus. No, let, <laughs> let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive. Oh, Lord, you're so good. As the law also says... And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone's ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So, Paul, what are you saying in verse 34? I don't know. Let's go to verse 35. No, what? <laughs> Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. What does that mean? Once again, remember the context of this portion of Scripture. We're speaking of order in the church. There are still to this day church services that are held where women are on one side of the church and men are on the other. In the uh, Jew Jewish synagogue, they would divide the women from the men, so the women would be on one side, the men on another. Church very often, services that were formal when there was instruction taking place, uh, they often were the same way. As a matter of fact, there are churches to this day that separate the women from the men. I, I was in India, and I went to a house church there, and you ladies will really appreciate this one. The men were all in the front of the house church, all in the front rows, and it was a small house. So all the men were, were seated in the front, and the fans, because we, we were in about 100 degree in that house, it was 100 degrees in the house and humidity. If you've ever been to India, it is oppressive heat. It isn't just heat, it's very oppressive, it's very hot. And so you're in crowded with all these people in a small home, so they had fans. And the fans were turned on the men in the front. There were no fans that were on the ladies who were seated in the back. And the men and the women were separated in that way. And in some churches in India to this day, there is a separation between the women and the men. And the men were getting the perks while the women were not. And that isn't right. I think that's terrible, to be honest with you. But that's what they were doing. They didn't ask my opinion concerning that. Had they, I'd have let them know. Are you kidding me? But they didn't. I just happened to be at the church service. And I saw that. So there are churches to this day that are still in existence, that have the women separate from the men. So if we were looking at this auditorium right now, and we were to structure it in that fashion, not with the men in the front and, and the women in the back, but as would have been normal, men on one side, women on the other, then this is what Paul would be speaking about in its context. Again, ensuring order in church. So I'm sharing something. 
and we'll say my wife Marie is, no, that wouldn't be, it wouldn't work with her. One of the ladies would be out there and she would say, I'd say, you know, the Lord says this. And during the service, the wife would yell across to the husband, you know, Epaphrodite. <laughs> What's he talking about? And, and the husband would shout back, oh, he said, and Paul is speaking concerning the rule that a woman should not be interrupting the teaching that's taking place. Those things ought not to take place in church services where people interrupt. Now, in its context, he's speaking of women interrupting, and the point he's making is if you have a question, now this is very practical, by the way, ladies, if you have a question, who should be answering your spiritual question? Paul would say, your husband, which puts the responsibility on the husband's shoulders to be a teacher in the home. What do we have today? Unfortunately, not in all homes, but in some, as a matter of fact, in many, we have women who are hungrier for the things of the Lord than their own husbands. And unfortunately, what happens in churches just like this is the wife will come for instruction from one of the men in the church or one of the women because they can't ask their husband because the husband's not in the word of God. And so the woman is hungry and wants to have answers, but the man, unfortunately, is not exercising his responsibility. The real answer is for, for me as a husband to take my spiritual responsibility seriously, to have my devotions, to spend time with the Lord. So if my wife were to approach me and say, you know, today I heard Pastor Chuck say this, and I really didn't get it. Can you help me with that? If I don't understand, then what I'm supposed to be doing is saying to my Marie, saying, you know, that's a great question, and you want to know something I don't understand either. But I'm going to find out. And then I'll go and I'll research it. If I have to speak to somebody like Chuck or whomever that can help me, that's what my responsibility is. Now, how does that work in a regular church like ours? I encourage husbands to be in the Word of God. I have had ladies who have been upset at me in the past who have wanted to make appointments for counseling with me. And I will speak to women, of course, but I will not have private counseling with them. I don't. Why? Because your husband has the responsibility to do that with you. Now, if I have any time with any of the women in the church, it isn't because I'm so afraid of them and, and they're all seductresses, and I, you know, it's not that at all. Not all of them. It's not that way at all. It's because biblically, the scripture teaches that the older women instruct the younger women. Titus made that clear in chapter 2. When it comes to answering questions, the husband, if they're married, has the responsibility of instructing the wife. He has that responsibility. You might find this interesting. You can go to Israel today and go to an Orthodox, go past an Orthodox synagogue, which we've done many times, on Shabbat. And you will walk by the Orthodox synagogue, and out in the courtyard will be the women and the children. And the women are visiting with their friends while the children are playing. And you look into the synagogue, and all the men are in there, because the Orthodox, at least the ones that we have seen in Israel, the Orthodox Jews take the responsibility of leading the home very seriously to the degree that the women aren't even required to be in synagogue, because that husband is supposed to be teaching her the ways of God. So these, these men, who are simply just regular guys, they're not rabbis, they're members of the synagogue, are being instructed. And they will take what they've learned and, like Scripture teaches, impart it to their families, you see? So in the church, Paul is simply making it very clear. There have been interruptions during church services where something has been said, and somebody from one side of the room says, what's going on? And then it's interrupting. He says, listen, if you have a question, let that question be asked at home. And let your husband be equipped to be able to answer that question for you. So it brings order in the church, and it isn't filled with people who are constantly interrupting it by asking questions that don't 
don't need to be asked at that time. Now, finally, in verse 36 in closing, did the word of God come originally from you or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, that word ignorant means without knowledge or uninstructed. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So when he asks in verse 36, did the word of God come originally from you? It's a rebuke. That's a rebuke to the argumentative members of the church. It would seem that some have contended with him or the pastor over this issue. And it may be that they were determined to follow their own ideas about it. So Paul's word is very clear. Did the word of God originally come from you? Are you putting yourself above God's word in this matter? If you do not write scripture as Paul did, then why don't you obey it? All Christians are subject to the word of God and none can overrule it. Now in verse 37, when he says, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, then he needs to acknowledge that what's being said is right. If you're spiritually mature, and this is really a key, by the way, if you're spiritually mature and you know the word is being rightly divided, your maturity will be revealed by your obedience to what you're learning. That's a fact, isn't it? If I'm spiritually mature, it's going to be demonstrated by my obedience to what the word of God is rightly saying to me, which means I'm going to submit to God's word and also respect the one who's teaching me. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says there, Obey your leaders, submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Ultimately, pastor teacher stands before the Lord to give an account of the sheep. A friend of mine, Gail Irwin, shares how that on one occasion, while he was at a pastor's conference, because he teaches and has taught in pastor's conferences for many years. He was at a pastor's conference when somebody approached him and said to him, you know, Gail, I'm discouraged. And Gail said that he responded by saying, really, why? And the guy said, well, because he goes, I, I only have 100 people in my church. And Gail says he looked at the guy and he said to him, you're kidding me. 100 people will come and listen to you? which puts things in perspective, doesn't it? One person is enough to feel accountable for. I have to give an account. As a pastor, I have to give an account for my wife. I give an account for those whom I have influence and authority over. And you might find this interesting if this is your home fellowship. I have to give an account for you. And so that's what Hebrews 13, 17 says. So when I give account, may it be done with joy and not with a burden. And that's how it works. So when people hear the word of God and they grow, then that gives to the, the pastor teacher great joy because they're growing in the things of the Lord. Now, when he says in verse 38, if anyone is ignorant, let them be ignorant. If anyone is without knowledge and unwilling to obey God's word, then you're going to have to just disregard his opinion, regard him as he is. He's opinionated, but he's ignorant of the word of God. And as such, don't take his counsel. He doesn't know God's word, and he doesn't obey God's word. There are those, unfortunately, and sometimes I've seen this with young believers who, who believe that because they're saved, they suddenly have an incredible knowledge of Scripture. And they want to give all kinds of advice, and they want to give direction. And if they're teachable, they can grow. If they're not, then I'll allow them to say to me what they want, but I don't regard them as being my instructors. And finally, in verse 39, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Do not forbid to speak with tongues. But here's the, 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 the conclusion. Uh, let all things be done decently and in order. Make, th make sure that the things that are done are orderly, and make sure that they're intended to bring glory to God. When you exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit, always exercise the gifts of the Spirit with the love of God. 
and a care for people. Let things be done in order to edify others, and God will bless you as you exercise those gifts. Very basic, isn't it? But very practical. Love the people you minister to and watch God move as you do so.